Hello and welcome to another edition of Paranormal Activity and Mysterious Stories. In this video, I want to just um, go over actually something I had mentioned in one of my other videos. Um, this document here that um, comes from a NASA, directly from a NASA website, the NASA.gov website. And it's basically um, stories of what could today be determined uh, or, or could be interpreted as um, UFOs in the past. You know, back in the past, people used terms that um, they were familiar with, like, you know, shields and things like that. That's how they describe these things. But um, I thought I would just devote uh, a video to uh, reading, you know, all of the stories on this because I realized you know, a lot of times I'll just um, read a few of the stories and then just tell people to uh, go to the link in the description. You know, I, I will definitely leave a, a link in the description to this, but um, I also understand that um, a lot of times people are listening to these videos while they're doing other things. So um, maybe they don't have time to, you know, go, or, or maybe, yeah, you don't have time to you know, go to the website and read this and would just rather have someone else read it to you. So uh, that's what this video is essentially going to be. I'm just going to um, read all of the different um, accounts of UFOs that um, that were compiled in this report. And, you know, I, I've said this in other videos. So anyone who's who's subscribed to my channel knows, you know, that I believe this. But yeah. I'm of the firm belief that um, most of these UFOs that we're seeing are not visiting. That the reason why we've been seeing them for thousands of years, and you know, you're going to see like some of these stories go back to uh, like 217 BC. Uh, the reason we've been seeing these crafts for so long is because we they are because they also live on this planet. You know, um, we happen to share this planet with several highly advanced species and um you know to some of the people that find that hard to grasp i mean just imagine like right now as we speak you know i mean i'm i'm making this video and putting it out on the internet um you know there were people who are flying around in planes heck you know we we're sending um, spacecraft to Mars, to other planets, right? But while we are doing all this, there are people that live right here on this planet who still live as if it's the prehistoric times. I mean, to them, time has, hasn't moved. You know, there are the they are the uncontacted tribes in the Brazilian rainforest. Uh, there are the, I think they're called the Sentinelese up by India. You know, I mean, they don't let any outsiders in. I'm sure that if if you were able to, uh, you know, visit them, you know, if you could travel back in time 5,000 years ago, it, nothing would, would probably be different for them. So, you know, you know, while everything is relative, you know, while at the same time, these people are living or yeah, are living basically as hunter gatherers, as as um, as cavemen, you know, uh, yes, prehistoric hunter gatherers. We are living in a quote unquote technologically advanced uh, world or ex advanced existence. And I think we're also in the same situation, you know, that in, in the same way that those uncontacted tribes don't know um, about us. I'm, you know, maybe a few of them do, but, you know, uh, generally, they don't know the ex to, they, they don't they aren't aware of the extent of our civilization. I think that we are also in the same boat. That um, you know that there are these other species that live in the ninety five percent of the planet that we haven't explored. Um, of course, you know uh, there has to be uh, several individuals within high levels of government, you know, that do have the ability to monitor all of our satellite systems, you know, they know what's going on. I think they, they're, they're aware of it. Um, but they don't let the, the general public know that stuff. But anyways, uh, let me just get into this. 
So these are unidentified flying objects in classical antiquity. The abstract, a combined historical and scientific approach is applied to ancient reports of what might today be called unidentified flying objects, UFOs. Many conventionally explicable phenomena can be weeded out, leaving a small residue of puzzling reports. These fall neatly into the same categories as modern UFO reports, suggesting that the UFO phenomenon, whatever it may be due to, has not changed much over two millennia. You see, these things have been going on for over 2,000 years. Now, granted, again, sure, I don't doubt that there are some crafts who are visiting from other planets. But I think the majority of the crafts that we see coming in and, of, in and out of our atmosphere here are from the, the civilizations that live on this planet. But anyways, throughout recorded history, reports of what we today might call unidentified flying objects have been made and preserved. If more information were available to us, we would perhaps find that conventional scientific hypothesis could explain most, if not all, of these. Certainly, this has turned out to be true of most reports from better documented periods. There nonetheless remains a small residue of puzzling accounts, and regardless of what interpretation one places on them, these constitute a phenomenon that spans centuries of time and widely different cultures. Yeah, you know, what they're saying that, sure, some of these um, could, could be explained away, uh, or, you know, there are reasonable explanations, but then there's just that handful that, um, yeah, you can't explain it, you know, but to acknowledge that um, they're being, you know, that or there are crafts that are being piloted out there. So let me just, um, let me uh, get right into these stories. All, all of this stuff is, uh, it's not really that important. But again, you know, I'll leave a link to this if you want to go ahead and read any of that stuff. But I just want to get right into the stories here. So here, the following three reports were made under the considerable pressure of the Second Punic Wars when prodigies were most likely sought more frequently and carefully than usual. The observers are unknown, but were probably many in number which may account for the spike in prodigy reports at this time. No compelling reason exists to infer an epidemic of mass hallucinations in central Italy, although Lively did note a measure of mass hysteria and even hysterical contagion among the populace because of the looming Carthaginian threat. At Rome in the winter of 1218 BC, a spectacle of ships gleamed in the sky. Franklin, not cross for lack of an Alternative explanation speculated that the ships were clouds or mirages. Although suggestive cloud formations have been long understood, familiar features. In 1217 BC at Arpe, round shields were seen in the sky. A parma was a small round shield made partly or wholly of iron, bronze, or another metal. We do not know whether the luster of these devices, and not just their shape, was intended to be an element of the description. Mock suns are an unlikely explanation, since in the Roman prodigy list, these were routinely described as double suns or triple suns. For example, two mock suns on either side of the real one. In 212 BC, at Riate, a huge stone was seen flying about. The implication would seem to be that the object in question was a stony gray color. That it is said to have moved irregularly leaves open the possibility that the object Lively describes was a bird or some kind of airborne debris. Sporadic reports of similar objects continue to appear after this in the Roman prodigy list. The immediate sources are again Lively and his extractors Pliny, Plutarch, Obsesquins, and Oresius. I'm not too sure if I said that correctly there. In 173 BC, at Lanuvium, a spectacle of a great fleet was said to have been seen in the sky. 
In 154 BC, at Kamsa, weapons appeared flying in the sky. The term refers to defensive weapons, especially shields. In 104 BC, the people of Amaria and Tudor observed weapons in the sky rushing together from east and west, those from the west being routed. Thus, Pliny, who uses the term arma, obsequence version is essentially the same. Plutarch calls the weapons flaming spears and oblong shields, but may be merely glossing and expanding since he noted at the time at as night. The phenomenon in question might be the streamers of an aurora borealis. In 100 BC, probably at Rome, a round shield burning and emitting sparks ran across the sky from west to east at sunset. Thus Pliny, although obsequence called the phenomenon a circular object like a round shield. The Clippius was a round shield similar to the Parma but bigger. Seneca, quoting Posidonus, referred to a class of clippery flagrantes, saying that they persisted longer than shooting stars. Nothing in the ancient reports forbid that these were spectacular bolides, meteoric fireballs, which move across the sky more slowly than ordinary shooting stars, but enormously faster than genuine comets, which aren't seen for days or weeks. In 43 BC at Rome, a spectacle of defensive and offensive weapons was seen to rise from the earth to the sky with a clashing noise. It might be possible to visualize in this report a bolide exploding while rising above the horizon. Historically, the most famous sky army appeared in the spring of AD 65 over Judea, the historian Josephus reports. On the 21st of the month, Artemisium, there appeared a miraculous phenomenon, passing belief indeed. What am I about to relate would I would imagine have been deemed a fable were it not for the narrative of eyewitnesses and the subsequent calamities which deserve to be so stigmatized. For before sunset throughout all parts of the country, chariots were seen in the air and armed battalions hurtling through the clouds and encompassing the cities. Although Josephus probably viewed this phenomenon himself and apparently did research on it, he appears to eyewitness accounts to bolster his credibility. The phenomenon does not seem to have been an aurora, cloud patterns, or meteors, but does resemble the aerial fighting of modern UFOs. Fiery Globes The first cluster of reports of fiery globes falls during the Second Punic War. Lively reports that in 217 BC at Capena, two moons rose in the daytime, and at Capua, a kind of moon fell during a rainstorm. The Capuan moon may have been a manifestation of ball lightning, but the two moons at Capena most likely were not. Mock moons are seen only at night when the real moon is very bright, but a bolite seen together with the real moon in the daytime or a bolite split in two is a possibility. Seneca gets two examples from the eastern Mediterranean in 168 BC when L. Amelius Pallas was waging a war against King Perseus of Macedon, a ball was the form of a fire that appeared as large as the moon. This could have been a bolide. A more complicated object made its appearance sometimes between 151 and 146 BC. After the death of Demetrius of Syria, a little before the Achean War, a comet blazed out not inferior to the sun. At first, it was a fiery red disk emitting a light so bright that it dissipated the night. There, little by little, its size dwindled and its brightness faded. At last, the light died completely. Since the object was seen for more than a moment designation as a cometus, it is probably not ball lightning or bolide. It also seems to have been too bright to have been the former and too stationary to have been the latter. Nor could it have been an instance of night sun, defined by Pliny as creating diffuse light in the nighttime sky and interpreted today as an aurora. 
Two parallel records of 91 BC preserved by lively extractors Orosius and Obsequence refers to central Italy. Over the city of Rome, about sunrise, a ball of fire shone forth from the northern region with a loud noise in the sky. The sonic boom indicates that this was probably a bolide rather than ball lightning, as Bicknell suggested. The same year, a much stranger object was noted near Spolodium. Furthermore, several Romans on a journey saw a gold-colored ball roll down from the sky to the earth. After growing larger, it was seen to rise upward again from the earth toward the rising sun and to block the sun itself by its size. Bicknell proposed that this was ball lightning, but outside of high-altitude storm clouds, ball lightning averages only 23 centimeters in diameter, and the description suggests something much larger than this. Although the reported vertical motion, drawn-out duration, and prevailing sunny weather are not unheard of in ball lightning observations, the combinations of improbable characteristics makes this explanation unattractive. The object's apparent trajectory appears more consistent with the approach, overhead passage, and retreat of a bolide. On the other hand, an actual landing on or near the ground is strongly indicated. Pliny also reports an incident that at first glance looks like the preceding one but occurred at night. A spark was seen to fall from a star and to grow as it approached the earth. After it had become as large as the moon, light was diffused all around as if on a cloudy day. Then, retreating to the sky, the object changed into a torch. This is recorded to have occurred only once. Silenus, the proconsul, with his retinue saw it in the consulship of Gnaeus Octavius and Gaius Scribonius. M. Janus Silenus was governor of the province of Asia in 76 BC, and the incident probably took place there. Silenus' testimony receives indirect support from an allusion by Lydus to several latter occurrences of the same phenomenon, although without reference to a torch. The size, brightness, and transience of the object at its maximum seem to rule out a comet or a new star, Nova, interpretation suggested by Barrett and Herzog, respectively. But Bicknell's proposal of ball lightning also founders on the object's change into a torch. Whitman has postulated a complex UFO encounter, but this explanation seems unnecessary. Since no landing of the object was reported, it is simplest and most natural to interpret the event as the overhead passage of a bolide leaving a luminous train. It is not until four centuries later that the next report in this category is found. At Antioch, in the daytime, a star was seen toward the eastern part of the sky emitting smoke, copiously as if from a furnace from the third hour to the fifth hour. This occurred A.D. 334 and was recorded by a Byzantine analyst, Theosophin Concifer, writing five centuries after the event and using unknown sources. The one-day, two-hour duration of the phenomenon is much too short for a comment. Despite the suggestions of Barrett, Mangle, and Scott, and Ramsey, while the smoking trail of a bolide would have appeared most unstarlike, being elongated, irregular, and gradually dissipative. Close Encounters of the First Kind Heineck defined a close encounter of the first kind as an observation at close range of a UFO that fails to interact with the observer and does not leave a physical trace. By this definition, the fiery red disc of 150 BC and the gold color ball of 91 BC might be considered borderline examples. A more characteristic example occurred in 74 BC when a Roman army under L. Licinius Lucullus was able to engage the forces of King Mithridates VI of Pontus, according to Plutarch. But presently, with no apparent change of weather, but all of a sudden the sky burst asunder and a huge flame-like body was seen to fall between the two armies. In shape, it was most like a wine jar, 
and in color like molten silver. Both sides were astounded at the sight and separated. This marvel, as they say, occurred in Figeria at a place called Odore. The presence of thousands of witnesses, including Lucilius and Mithridates, vouches for the incident's occurrence. The term pithos was routinely applied by ancient meteorologists to any large barrel-shaped smoky celestial fire, according to Poseidonus. Could the object of 74 BC have been a meteorite? The bright silvery color might describe the incandescence of the object while falling, but freshly fallen meteorites are black and Plutar makes no mention of any noise, let alone an impact. The object must have measured much more than a meteor cross since it was easily resolved at a distance greater than half the range of a bow shot. If it had remained on the ground, a meteorite of such size would doubtless have become a cult object in Figeria with its long tradition of meteorite worship, yet later historical records referring to the Figerian meteorite are silent about it. In modern experience, an episode like this would easily fall under the rubric of a classic UFO encounter, but we cannot rule out the fall of a bolide. A fourth incident is known from a biography of St. Anthony, probably written by Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, following a personal interview with the witness years afterward. The date was A.D. 285, in or near the Fayum in the Egyptian desert. Anthony saw on the desert floor a large silver disc that suddenly vanished like smoke. Although the encounter is introduced into the biography in a straightforward factual way, the biography is noted for its religious visage and even if authentic, the operation may have been a desert mirage. Close Encounters of the Second Kind In Hynek's system, a close encounter of the second kind leaves a physical trace. Ancient literature contains no record of a UFO-like object pressing an imprint into the ground or depositing a material residue. On the other hand, rains of strange material were occasionally reported, and since analogous reports in modern UFO research are accepted when sufficiently well documented and verified, ancient examples are cited here in the absence of more direct evidence. In modern reports, a whitish gossamer substance dubbed angel hair is said on rare occasions to have dropped from a UFO and sometimes to have vanished completely on contact with the ground. In other reports, glassy fibers are left by a UFO after takeoff from the ground, or a chalky substance remains. An ancient sample of angel hair was perhaps picked up at Rome in AD 196 by the historian Cassius Dio, who wrote, A fine rain resembling silver descended from a clear sky upon the Forum of Augustus. I did not, it is true, see it as it was falling, but noticed it after it had fallen, and by means of it I plated some bronze coins with silver. They retained the same appearance for three days, but by the fourth day all the substance rubbed on them had disappeared. Others fall in which a solid whitish substance was involved include two reigns of chalk, one in Chaos in 214 BC and another at Rome in 98 BC. No other information is offered about the physical nature of this chalk. Close Encounters of the Third Kind A close encounter of the third kind involves UFOs seen in association with an occupant, usually described as human or humanoid. According to Livy, in 214 BC at Hadria, an altar was seen in the sky. Around it were forms of men dressed in shining white, the nature of the altar is not specified, but four years earlier in the district of Amatinium, in many places, forms of men dressed in shiny white were seen at a distance. They did not approach anyone. Except for this report, entities unassociated with the UFO will not be a subject of investigation here, as problems of identification and verification present insurmountable obstacles even in modern cases, as Heineck and others have shown. The incident 
of 214 BC nonetheless strikingly recalls the classic observation of UFO occupants on a hovering overhead craft seen by Father Gill and his companions in 1959 off Papua New Guinea. The last encounter is again from the early Christian hagiographical literature and took place near the Via Campana between Rome and the Capua, A.D. 150. On a sunny day, a beast like a piece of pottery, about 100 feet in size, multicolored on top and shooting out fiery rays, landed in a dust cloud accompanied by a maiden clad in white. There was only one witness to the event, probably Hermias, the brother of Pope Pius I. Now the conclusion, this collection of what might be termed ancient UFO reports has been culled from a much larger number of reports of aerial objects, most of whose identification with known phenomenon are either certain or at least highly probable. Embedded in the mass of relatively inexplicable ancient reports, however, is a small set of unexplained, for at least not wholly explained, reports from presumably credible witnesses. If these reports are examined statistically, essential features of what I will for argument's sake call ancient UFO phenomenon can be extracted. Shape. Discoidal or spheroidal. I've never heard of that word. Color. Silvery, golden, or red. Texture. Metallic or occasionally glowing or cloudy. Size. A meter to well over a meter. Sound. Usually none reported. Type of motion, hovering, erratic, or smooth flight with a rapid disappearance. A lot like the videos we see of how they just will just zoom out and disappear or slowly turn into a tiny dot and disappear. In at least one instance, the presence of occupants covered in shiny white clothing is reported. Encounters range from distant views to possibly actual contact. The preferred place and time of observation seem to be rural areas in the daytime. Physical evidence is generally lacking. Greek and Roman scientific thinkers, who were never at a loss for theories, usually regarded these types of aerial phenomena as stars, clouds, atmospheric fires, light reflections, or moving material bodies. Since most of the original theories hark back to Aristotle and his predecessors, with none being later than Poseidonus, they generally predate the reports collected here, none of which is earlier than 218 BC. It is accordingly impossible to know whether the later observers, mostly practical Romans, interpreted the phenomenon literally as they described them or were simply using the best descriptive language they were capable of while holding back on theoretical speculations. But any viable theory must reckon with the extraordinary persistence and consistency of the phenomenon discussed here over many centuries. Whether one prefers to think in terms of universal recurrent visions from the collective unconscious, misperceptions of ordinary objects, unusual atmospheric effects, unknown physical phenomenon, or extraterrestrial visitations, what we today would call UFO possess an intrinsic interest that has transcended the passage of time and the increase of human knowledge. So uh, that's it for this video. This was a uh, kind of a long video, so I'm going to uh, end it right here. But uh, if you like things like this, please give this a video a thumbs up. You know, um, I like to hear some of your um, ideas in the description. And uh, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe. I will have more videos like this. Otherwise, take care.